So now that we've seen one metabolic system, I want to look at the major metabolic system in almost all living cells. Um, it's at least the first part is in all living cells that we know of. And it starts with this. Here is a marshmallow that somebody put into a fire. You may have done this before. And when you put it in the fire, it'll catch on fire. But then when you pull it out in this picture, as you can see, it continues to burn. So my question is, is this marshmallow exergonic or endergonic? The answer to that question relates to why it is that marshmallows taste so good to so many people. This reaction here, if you're looking at the material that's reacting, it's mainly sugar. There's high fructose corn syrup in here and some gelatin, stuff like that. And what I want to do is look at the fructose. Well, the fructose that is in this marshmallow has this molecular formula, C6H12O6. It's exactly the same as glucose, same as galactose. They're all three isomers of each other. And so what's going to happen here is some reaction is going to occur. We already know kind of what the reaction is from a previous lecture. It's oxidation. And remember, oxidation is, is, is an exchange of electrons with reduction being the gain of the electrons. And remember, we didn't talk about the electrons being just electrons. They are the energy source that's being transferred. That is what's happening here. That's burning. Whenever you see fire, you're looking at oxidation. That's, that's what oxidation really is. So what's going on with this? What would happen if you were to let this marshmallow burn on this stick and just burn and burn and burn? Would you end up with the same amount of mass clinging to the stick that you started with when you put the fresh marshmallow on there? Well, if you've ever done this before, and if you haven't, you really should, you get a blob of, of goo, basically a gooey charred mass at the end. But if you think about the size of that, that's way smaller than the marshmallow. What's more important is it weighs a lot less than the marshmallow. So somehow the marshmallow's mass is, ch is disappearing here. But the problem is this, in this universe, we can't really change mass. We can't get rid of mass except for nuclear reactions. And this is definitely not a nuclear reaction. There's no radiation coming out here or anything like this. This is all a chemical reaction. So the chemical reactions cannot violate the conservation of mass, meaning that the total amount of mass before and after the reaction has to be the same. That's precisely why we have to balance chemical equations. So the question is, where did the mass go? It's somewhere. It's just no longer on the stick. So where did it go? Well, this is converted into something, and it's converted into two gases. This fructose becomes two different gases. One of them is carbon dioxide, and the other one is water. The water goes off as water vapor because of the heat. So that's what's happening. We're taking this carbon, and we're making it into this form of carbon. Now notice are both these carbon forms organic? Well, remember, the definition of organic compound is any compound that has carbon in it except carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Here's carbon dioxide on the right-hand side of the reaction. There's carbon that's not carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide on the left-hand side. And so you see in this reaction, we're going from an organic compound to a non-organic compound. So this is the opposite of synthesis. This is precisely the opposite of synthesis. We're not taking inorganic carbon to make organic. We're going the other way. Okay, but this reaction can't occur, and the reason it can't occur is because of conservation of mass, just like I said before. If you look at the total number of carbons on this side, how many of them are there? How many hydrogens? How many oxygens? Okay, now, you should already know this. You do definitely already know this. There's six carbons on this side, 12 on this side, and six oxygens. 12 hydrogens, six carbons, six oxygens. On this side of the reaction, after the reaction has occurred, there's only one carbon, three hydro uh, oxygens, and two hydrogens. So we have to balance this equation. All right, so we know how to balance equations, but let's just do it quickly. First, let's look at the carbons. If we look at the carbons, I've got six on this side, one on this side. That means I've got to have six of these carbon dioxides come off. So there's a six. All right, the hydrogen, same sort of thing. I got 12 on the left, two on the right. So if I get six waters, that's going to balance the hydrogens. But now look at the oxygens. We've messed up the oxygens. There's six oxygens on the left side. There's six times two plus six is 18 total. Six times two, 12 plus six becomes 18. I got 18 oxygens here and only six over here. So how can I balance it? Don't try to put coefficients in here anymore because it won't work. Here's the problem. If you put any coefficients in front of this fructose, then you're going to have to put coefficients here at the same proportions and you can't balance it that way. It's impossible to balance it that way. The only way to balance it is to add oxygen on this side. Okay, there we are. 602 right there. So now, if you look here, I've got six oxygen molecules, O2, 
So that gives me a total of 12 plus 6, there's the 18. And this right here is the balanced equation. So this is a balanced equation for this reaction, this oxidation of the fructose that's in this marshmallow. Okay, so <clears throat> during this reaction, you can tell that it's spontaneous. You know it's spontaneous because when you pull the marshmallow out of the fire, it continues to burn. Therefore, you should be able to tell me right now, does it have a positive delta G or negative delta G? Is it exergonic or endergonic? And that was our original question, exergonic or endergonic. Well, again, since it's spontaneous, spontaneity is equated with a, a delta G that is negative, which is equated with exergonic reaction. In fact, this is an exergonic reaction. And it releases a fair amount of energy. It releases 686 kilocalories per mole of fructose. So you start with a mole of fructose, you're going to get a lot of energy out of it. 686 kilocalories. And that is why marshmallows taste so good to most people. It represents an enormous amount of energy. And so you can go through this reaction and release that energy. But here's the point. This reaction, when you balance it, that's not just something you do in class. That's something nature has to do. If nature can't do that, the reaction can't occur. So without this oxygen, you can't burn this, you can't oxidize this, this fructose. So in this situation, that's why it is, this will only burn if there's oxygen available in the atmosphere. If you were to spray carbon dioxide on this, the, the fire would go out, which is why it is that fire extinguishers have carbon dioxide in them. They take the oxygen away. But what about this inside your body? Why is it that it tastes so good? Well, it's because it's exergonic. And here's the problem you have to solve. We saw this before. This is the central problem of metabolism. If you look, if you have a, a mole of ATP and you break it down into a mole of ADP and free phosphate, we know already that that's delta G is negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole. Notice this is way less than the, the glucose. Glucose gets 686, almost 700 kilocalories. So it's 100 times more than this ATP. But the point is that you can get a mole of this ATP and release a certain amount of energy, and then you can use that energy for some sort of an endergonic process, a process that itself wouldn't occur on its own. So you can, for example, move your pen when you're writing on a piece of paper. You can speak, you can move your jaw, you can push air, you can pump blood. All of those things are endergonic, they're non-spontaneous, they need an energy source. And in almost every case, Whenever you transfer chemical potential energy inside your body into some sort of kinetic energy, you're using ATP to do it. So that's why ATP is so important. The problem is you do that a lot. Cells are constantly pumping ions across their membranes. We've seen that before. Half the energy of the cell uses at rest just simply controls sodium and potassium. And that's pumping uh, sodium and potassium across the membrane using active transport, half of the energy. So there's a bunch of other things that cells are doing. They're building proteins. They're breaking things down. They're doing all this other metabolism, much of which requires this outside energy source because most of those reactions, a lot of those reactions, are endergonic. So they use ATP to drive it. Now here's the problem that I said before. The average cell only has about 2 billion ATP in it, but it's burning when it's at rest. It's burning ATP at a rate of 100 million per second. So if you have 2 billion and you're burning at a rate of 100 million per second, each cell would, would run out of ATP in 20 seconds. And if you run out of ATP, that cell is going to die, as we saw before, it's going to explode. So what do you have to do? Well, you've got to take all this ADP and free phosphate that you've released when you, when you oxidize and burn the ATP and bring it back into ATP. How much energy does that take? Well, that's going to take the exact opposite in sign, but the same amount. In other words, if this is releasing ATP to ADP is releasing 7.3 kilocalories per mole, then it takes 7.3 to make a mole of ATP. So we need 7.3 kilocalories for every mole of ATP that we make. So where do we get that? Here, that marshmallow, among other things. So you can eat the marshmallow. The marshmallow goes into your uh, body, gets digested. The sugar that's in that marshmallow gets put in your blood. It gets converted to glucose. That glucose is then taken to your cells, and this then is the cellular respiration. It's exergonic. It takes that glucose, the exact same glucose that's burnt in this burning marshmallow, and releases its energy to regenerate all that ATP. And that is why you have a circulatory system. It's why you got a cardiovascular system. It's why you have a heart. It's why you have lungs. All of that is built around this reaction. You eat this, you carry it to your cells in your blood. You breathe this in with your lungs. You carry that to your cells with your blood. 
the, your cells then take those two things, run this reaction, release that 686 kilocalories per mole, and make ATP. But in the process, it must produce water and carbon dioxide because it has to balance the equation. The water goes into your body, no problem, but the carbon dioxide is a problem. As your cells produce carbon dioxide, it causes carbonic acid to form in your blood. When that happens, then the cell has to get rid of that carbon dioxide or else your blood pH is going to go down. It's going to become more acidic. So what do you do? You put this into the blood, take it to the lungs, and breathe that out. We're going to see that in more detail here very shortly. So the difference between what happens with a marshmallow in a campfire and what happens in your body is not so much in terms of what that equation is all about and what the energy is being released, but how it's done. In your body, it's controlled. It's very controlled. It has to be because the whole problem that you've got to overcome is the problem we saw before when we looked at enzymes. You can't just start a reaction from nothing. You have to add the activation energy first. And if you remember, the activation energy to start most reactions is pretty high. So that's why it is, for example, you have to put a marshmallow in a fire to get it started. Yeah, that reaction is exergonic, but the activation energy requires you to put it into a fire to get it started, which is why it is that marshmallows don't just burst into flames on the shelves in the store. So the problem with your body, though, of course, obviously, is you can't catch on fire in order to get these things to release the energy so you can make the ATP. You have to control it, and an enzyme, one single enzyme, is not enough. It can't lower the activation energy enough to get this reaction started. It has to work through a series of enzymes, through a series of what we call biochemical cascades, in order to get all that energy extracted off of that glucose, which is a lot, 686 uh, kilocalories per mole. So here's where you start. Glucose, we were looking at fructose before, but again, it's an isomer. What you do is you take that glucose, instead of burning it, you send it through a process that is called the Parnas M, uh, 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 Emden Par... Uh, uh, screw that. So what you've got to do is you have to take that glucose and send it through the first of these pathways, which today we call glycolysis. And what glycolysis is going to do is start the process. It's going to add activation energy. It's going to begin the process of the oxidation and extract some of the energy. But when you're done, you end up with two molecules that are not completely oxidized. In fact, they're, they're py pyruvates, which is the conjugate base of pyruvic acid. So the glucose is converted into those two things. We're going to see that here very shortly. But then what you have to do in order to get all the energy off is you have to then send it through another pathway, but this pathway requires oxygen. You start in this next pathway with a step called pyruvate oxidation, which does what it says. It oxidizes the pyruvate that you produce in the glycolysis. But then pyruvate oxidation is then sent, sending its products to something called the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle is, again, require, it doesn't happen in cells unless there's oxygen, but it will extract the vast majority of the energy off of that glucose until eventually you end up with other compounds that you then need to convert to ATP. And that's done through a process called the electron transport chain, which is coupled to another process called oxidative phosph phosphorylation. And when you're done with all of that, you're going to produce the six carbon dioxides that we saw in the balanced equation before and the six water molecules, which we saw in the balanced equation before. And some of that, a very small amount actually, but some of that 686 kilocalories is going to be captured as ATP. The CO2 is coming out of the pyruvate oxidation in the Krebs cycle. But the question then is, is this equation balanced? Well, remember, we're missing something. Glucose, C6H12O6, and here we get six carbon dioxides and six waters. We're not balanced. We have to balance the oxygen. So remember, we had to put in six oxygen. Where in this process is the six oxygen put in? Right here at the electron transport chain. At the very end of the electron transport chain is where we use the oxygen. So this is the sequence of events that occurs when we're making, extracting the energy off of the glucose. And it's not a simple thing. I'm sorry, folks. It just isn't simple. I can't make it simple. That's the problem. I'll try to make it as clear as I possibly can, but I can't make it actually simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to study each one of these processes in detail, but it's going to take some time for you to study it, memorize it, learn about it at the level that we need you to know it in order to move on to your next level classes. So before we continue here, I want to step back and talk about the philosophy of this class and ed your education in general, because it applies here very, very directly. This has two aspects to it. The first aspect is that this is not easy. This is something that requires a lot of detailed thought, a lot of detailed understanding of things. Uh, it's not a matter of 
of mathematics, for example, of learning how to solve a problem or, or being able to see the solutions to problems and things like this. This is a lot of information that you need to assimilate and understand so that you can think about it properly. To be a properly educated scientist, you need to be able to do both of those things. Those two things are required. I hear far too many people say, well, I don't like this because it's too much math, or I don't like this because it's too much memorization. Ladies and gentlemen, you must do both. You have to be good at both. But the issue with this is this. Some of you are going to use this in a lot more detail and need and want that detail more than others. Some of you aren't going to use a lot of these details in your career. If you're going into medicine, then yeah, you're going to need a lot of this in detail. You're going to, your first semester, your first year of medical school, you're going to go into this in a huge amount of depth, way more than I'm going to. If you're going into other fields, you may not necessarily ever see this in this kind of level of detail again, but all of us, all of us professional biologists will use this information because this is the centerpiece of all life. Okay, now, the way I've been speaking is the way most people, I think, tend to think about these kinds of problems, but I want to introduce a new perspective. The question, tell me what I need to know. What should I study? What should I learn because of what I need to know? is a mistake. It's the wrong question. The question is not, what do I need to know? The proper question is, what do you personally want to know? That's the important thing. That's why you're here. It's very important that we don't confuse and conflate the concept of training with the concept of education. Education is learning how to use your brain in a very, very precise but broad way. Knowing things, taking that knowledge and understanding it and being able to use it and synthesize it to, to solve novel problems that you've never dealt with before. Training is different. Training is learning how to do a particular task. This is not training, this is education. So the question you should ask yourself right now is what do you want to know? Not what do you need to know for the test. I'm going to give you every opportunity to learn it. But I'm not going to make it simple because if I make it simple, then it is wrong. I'm not going to make it wrong. I am, however, going to give you a choice. You can study it at one level, and I call that the B level, because if you study it at that level and you are able to express your understanding at that level, then you'll basically be operating at the level of a B. You'll miss certain questions on the final exam, I can guarantee you that, but you won't miss so many questions that you'll fail the final exam. You'll get a B. If you want to learn it more deeply, then you can study it at the A level, which I'll show you here in a moment. If you study at the A level, then you have a very good chance of answering all the questions on the final exam, or at least most of them, that will put you in the A range. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you nothing you didn't already know, by the way. You've had that choice every single moment of your career in school. You've chosen how deeply you personally want to know it. So that's going to continue on. You're educating yourself, which means how deeply do you want to know it. You have to make that choice. I'm going to show you then first this level that I call the B level. The study that if you know it, you'll miss questions on the final exam, but you'll pass. If you want to spend more time with it and get it more deeply, then I'll show you the A level. But let's start with the B level. At the B level, we're going to look at glucose in a very, very simple way. Only six carbons. There will only be six carbons in this uh, uh, way of looking at it. There are still 12 hydrogens and six oxygens, but I'm not going to show them. Not at the B level. At the A level, I'll show them. All we're going to do is look at what happens to this chain at the B level to get a sense of what's happening with the energy transfers. So we start with glucose, and I again represent it here, C6 and the H12O6 are not seen. The very first step of glycolysis is to start to add the activation energy into this molecule. And remember, the activation energy is required to get a reaction to occur, to get the oxidation, oxidation to occur. Now we saw before that enzymes are able to take those uh, uh, molecules and lower their activation energy to get a reaction to occur at a lower energy state, and therefore just with the, with the thermal energy in the system. That's insufficient here. There's no way we can add that much energy even with a single enzyme. So what we have to do is add energy in a different way. And what we do is we go through this reaction here. Okay, now look carefully what happened. I'm going to number these carbons from right to left. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm not making that up. That's how we number the carbons. And at the A level, you'll see why this is the way that we number them. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through this reaction. I see what happened. This glucose became glucose with a phosphate group on carbon number six. And so we call it glucose six phosphate. 
the phosphate group came from this side reaction, ATP to ADP. Okay? Now you should see in your head, draw this out, that ATP has three phosphates, alpha, beta, gamma. The phosphate here is the gamma phosphate, and alpha and beta are still on this ADP. Now, this reaction, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, I should be able to ask you on the exam, is it exergonic or endergonic? Okay, now you've got to think that through. If we look at this, it's coupled to another reaction that you know. ATP to ADP, you know, is exergonic. It releases 7.3 kilocalories per mole. So if this is an exergonic reaction coupled to this other reaction, the other reaction is almost certainly endergonic. And that's exactly what's happening. This is an endergonic reaction, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. This reaction is not spontaneous. It requires an outside energy source. The outside energy source in this case is ATP. We've seen that before. This is the activation energy. The phosphate group that's added to carbon number six is the activation energy, in part, not all of it. It's not enough to start the reaction yet. What we have to do is we have to add more energy to this to get the reaction to, to really, really start. The problem is this. To get this reaction started, I have to put another phosphate group on here. Putting a phosphate group on a molecule is like coming up and hitting it with a hammer. So this has now energized the molecule, but it's not, it's not energized enough. I have to add another one. The problem is, and you cannot see this at the B level, you will at the A level, the problem is that there are no available carbons to phosphorylate to put a phosphate group on now. What I have to do is I have to isomerize this glucose from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. So here is a fructose. Now at the, a, at the A level you'll see the difference, but at the B level you can't. But everything here now is fructose. It's an isomer. But what that does, and you'll, again you'll see this at the A level, is it makes this carbon free. Okay, now this carbon is now free for phosphorylation, and so we go through this reaction. Notice it's very similar to the first one. Fructose 6-phosphate gains a phosphate now, but this time on carbon number 1. And so we call it fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, not biphosphate. We're not cutting a phosphate in half. It's two of them, so it's bis. So again, the energy that came again is ATP to ADP. I again can ask you, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, is that exergonic or endergonic? You know it's endergonic because it's coupled to an exergonic one. Exergonic and endergonic are coupled. Okay, so if you see one, you recognize it as exergonic, the other one is endergonic. Okay, so now we have enough energy. We've got enough energy to start the reaction. And the very first reaction that occurs is this right there. That bond right in the middle between carbons 3 and 4 is the bond we're going to break. We now have enough energy to do that. And so what we do is we break the bond then by doing this. We uh, have an enzyme come in here, lowers the activation energy where that bond can break on its own, and we end up then with these two molecules, two three-carbon compounds, each with a phosphate group, and they have the name glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, which we simply abbreviate as G3P. All right, so these steps here are the beginning steps of glycolysis. This is just adding activation energy to get the reaction started. This is the first reaction where we can now start to extract energy off this molecule. Okay, before we continue, keep in mind what we're doing, why we're doing this. The whole purpose of this goes back to the central problem of metabolism that I showed you before. 2 billion ATP per cell, burning at a rate of 100 million per second, 20 seconds of ATP left. The whole purpose of glycolysis is to regenerate that ADP into ATP. Hey, that's the point. We haven't done that. ATP has gone to ADP. We've gone exactly the opposite direction. So we're not there yet. We've simply added energy. Now we need to extract energy. And we're going to have to extract more than 2 ATP because we've already used 2 ATP. So this is the beginning at the B level of this reaction. Now, I'm going to ask you questions on the final exam that will ask you to both describe these events and explain them. Again, description is how something is. Explanation is why something is. And remember, I. I basically said everything that uh, was happening and why it happened. So that's what I want you to study in addition to just these events. Okay, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to G3P. Yes, memorize that, know that. ATP here, ATP here, memorize that, know that, but be able to say why. First, why are we doing this? We're adding activation energy. Why is the ATP doing this? It adds energy. It's not enough, so I have to isomerize. Then I have to add more energy. And now I can split it. That's the level of explanation I want you to be at at the P level. At the A level, I'll show you more details of exactly what it is we need. OK, so here we are in the middle of glycolysis. We've added activation energy and broken the molecule apart into two molecules of G3P. 
Now, I'm only going to show what happens to one of the two molecules. Keep that in mind because it's important. We need to figure out what's going to happen to a glucose molecule. So realize this is going to happen twice per glucose. Everything I'm showing you is going to happen twice. Okay, so we have our G3P, and what we're going to do is we're going to take this G3P and we're going to go through a very large exergonic reaction. Right, so if we see that reaction, it's hard to tell just by looking at it that it's exergonic because it looks kind of like one of the endergonic reactions that we saw in the previous scheme. But here, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, again, has the one phosphate on it, gets a phosphate here. At the B level, that's all you're going to be able to see. At the A level, you'll see more detail. But here, it gets a phosphate onto this carbon here on the other end. And so we go from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to bisphosphoglycerate, BPG. Now, there's a reaction, a side reaction. You, you see, first look at this. This piece of I means an inorganic phosphate, which means basically a phosphate just floating around in the substrate. Now, that substrate level phosphate is a low energy phosphate. It's different than the phosphates that were added in the previous steps. If we go back up here, these phosphates came off of ATP, so they're high energy phosphates. This phosphate is a low energy phosphate. And what we're doing is we're releasing energy, we're oxidizing a bit from this G3P and raising a phosphate to a higher energy state so we can put it on the organic molecule. So this is very, very different. Just adding phosphate is not always just is, is not always adding energy. You're adding energy when you're adding a high energy phosphate off ATP. If you're adding a low energy substrate phosphate, that's how you're sort of storing energy on this molecule. But you also have a side reaction here, NAD plus to NADH plus a hydrogen uh, ion or proton. So this side reaction here, NAD to NADH, I could ask you this, is that oxidation or reduction? Remember, if something gains oxygen, it's oxidized. If something loses hydrogen, it's oxidized. And the opposite, then, is true. If something gains oxygen, I'm sorry, loses oxygen, it's reduced. If something gains hydrogen, it's reduced. Notice, NAD, nothing happened with the oxygen, but it gained a hydrogen. So this step here, NAD to NADH, is reduction. Remember, reduction is gain of energy, not just gain of electrons. It's gain of energy. So we've gained energy here, and what we've done here is this. We've released a bunch of energy from the G3P, and we've stored it now on this NADH. Therefore, we call the NADH an electron carrier. Remember, oxidation reduction? Reduction is gain of electrons. It's now got electrons on it. And we're going to see at the A level exactly how many electrons there are. But this then is an endergonic reaction. Remember, reduction is gain of energy. Therefore, it must be endergonic which means it's not spontaneous. It needs to be driven by this reaction here, G3P to BPG. OK, so we've got some of the energy off of the, off the molecule, but we're not quite done yet. There's still quite a bit of energy on this BPG. So the next step is we're going to remove one of these phosphates. And we do that. When we remove the phosphate, we take bisphosphoglycerate and make it into 3-phosphoglycerate, which is very similar to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. It doesn't have an aldehyde group on it. It's a slightly different molecule, which I'll show you at the A level. But at any rate, we've taken this phosphate off. So look what happened. We took this inorganic low energy phosphate, put it onto the molecule, and now it's high enough energy I can put it onto ATP. So I've made an ATP here, and that's our goal. Remember, that's the whole point of this whole process, is to make ATP. So we're putting in this ATP onto here, and now I've got 3-phosphoglycerate. I've still got a phosphate group on that 3-phosphoglycerate, and I can do the same thing. I can take that phosphate group off and get it onto ATP. Here's the problem, and I'm sorry, I can't make this simpler. The phosphate on that 3PG is held extremely tightly based on where it is on the molecule. You can't see why at the B level, but you'll be able to see some sense of it, why it is at the A level. So what we have to do is we have to loosen this phosphate up. To do that, the very first thing we do is we take this phosphate, move it from the third carbon to the second, put it onto the middle one. Why does that loosen it? You'll see at the A level. Right now, you just have to know at the B level, it does. Now, it's loosened. I can remove that phosphate, but it's not quite loose enough to take off easily and put onto ATP. So what I need to do is I need to rearrange this molecule from 2-phosphoglycerate into another molecule called phosphoenol pyruvate, or PEP. Once I have this, now this phosphate is loose enough that I can remove it and get enough energy out of it to put it onto ATP. And that's exactly what the very last step of glycolysis is. I take the PEP, convert it to pyruvate, which is the conjugate base of pyruvic acid, and I make an ATP. So that is the B level of glycolysis. Again, if you're studying it at this level, what you need to be able to do is not only describe what's happening in these pictures, in other words, draw them all out, 
but you should also be able to explain every step, explain each step that occurs in this process.